my worst enemy The flesh that's covering me Brings me down to my knees Welcome to Sermons in the Park a ministry exploring biblical truth from the Word of God, focusing on the truths that help us in our daily walk with Christ in every aspect of our lives. Now, here is your Reverend, Jamie McCaskill. Hello, brothers and sisters, and welcome back to an all-new Sermons in the Park. As always, I am your Reverend, Jamie McCaskill. I want to take this time like I do each and every week and welcome you back and tell you it's a always great and wonderful to be able to be here with you each and every Sunday morning. Now before we get started, you're going to hear that noise. That's my air conditioner. Um, I, this sermon is going to be long. So what I did was I, I went into a separate room in my house to just record this for you so my wife can do what she's doing and my son can cook and everything without being disturbed. So let's do like we do each and every week and go in prayer to our Heavenly Father, you know, to thank Him for everything He's done. Heavenly Father, we want to say thank you once again for being here, to, you know, being you, you know, allowing us to wake up every morning to be able to see this beautiful world that you've given us, to see the things like our children, our pets, and our loved ones, and, and um, being able to share in this existence that you give us. Now, Heavenly Father, today, I'm gonna ask. Uh, I'm gonna ask something of you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask Father that you touch our listeners today and open their ears and help them to listen to feel the weight of truth from the verses we're going to be studying today, Father. That Revelations 14, 9 to 11, and and open their hearts and their minds, especially those who are listening who who may not be a follower of Christ today and, and let them see the the warning that you give us in those verses father to help them to flee back to you to listen to my words and and father i i pray also that you 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 touch my lips and my tongue today and and help me to to convey the message that you want you wish for our followers to hear in the name of your son jesus christ amen so before we get started, I want to mention this. You know, a um, long time ago, I, I when I started doing my verse by verse, uh, the, the expository sermons, um, one of the ones I, I could not wait to get to, and which we never have, is Romans chapter 11. Um, I've spoken on this in the past. I love the book of Romans. I feel that the book of Romans is Paul's masterpiece on grace. And, it, and Romans 11 is different. Uh, especially different to, compared to what we're going to be talking about today. You know, um, but the reason I bring it up is because one of the reasons I, you know, we haven't gotten there is Romans chapter 11, uh, it's a, it's difficult. It's difficult for, for me to be able to express just how beautiful and magnificent it is, especially that hymn at the end. Just, just go read it sometimes. Read Romans chapter 11 and you'll see that in it, Paul unfolds the gospel. And he ends it by celebrating just how great God is. I'll show you real quick. Let's look at Romans chapter 11. We're going to just look at three verses. We're going to look at Romans chapter 11, verses 33 to 36. Paul says this, All oh, the depth of the riches both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are your judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord or who hath been his counselor or who hath first given to him and it shall be recomp recompensed unto him again. For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever amen now isn't that powerful do you do you see or I should say do you feel the weight in it I know I did 
just look at how how joyful Paul is when he praises the wisdom of God. Personally, I know that I could never write something as beautiful as that, as powerful as that. And then you look at the subject of today's sermon. Revelations chapter 14, verses 9 to 11. In this one, we see an opposite. One that I honestly feel that I could never capture the weight of it. I, I, I feel that I could never express the emotion or the tone of it properly to you. Because see, this verse here, it shows us that hell is a real place. A place of eternal torment. And not only is it eternal, but this torment, while you're experience, while the per, while the person who's who's in hell is is being tormented, they're conscious of the fact that they're being tormented. This this is taught all throughout the Bible. If you read it, it's clearly there. Now, I'm sure you noticed that when I was praying today, you know, I did something a little differently because usually I just I just pray for thank I pray our thanks to God. I thank Him for everything that He's done for us. Right. And the reason I did that is because I feel it's important to deliver this properly. I I, I don't want to see anyone go to hell, ever. Right? I'm, I'm sure that you, you could say the same thing. No matter if you like me or not, I, I want to see you go to heaven. I love all of you. I want to see all of you go there one day. Now, since I became a minister, if you were to meet me in person... And you can ask anyone who, who has met me in person. You know, it's very rare when you'll see me somewhere not reading some book. Because I'm studying. I'm studying my sermon. I'm studying to, to preach, right? And I once read this book. And, and it, uh, I think it was either a book or it was online. Because like, I read, I'm always reading. But this minister, he was doing a funeral. And he got to a point where... You know, um, when we do funerals, we uh, I know I do, I ask, does anyone want to stand up and, and, and speak about the person who's deceased? And he did that. And, and this time, uh, the person who died's sister stood up and spoke about how her sister, you know, didn't love the Bible. She did not love Jesus. She did not go to church. This woman said that she believed her sister was, well, not in heaven. She then told everyone that was there that there was still time for them to come to God. And then the woman sat back down. Now, let me ask you this. How many of any of you would be brave enough to stand up and do that same thing? But honestly, we should none of us should be afraid to do that. We should love everyone enough to warn them, to give them the basic message that we find over in Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 give me a second my computer is I'm trying to get to the verse but sorry my computer kind of froze there for a second but anyway the verse of uh, Hebrews 9.27 says this, And it is appointed unto man once to die, but after that, the judgment. Right? Either, but what this Bible is making it clear is that this, you're either going to go to one of two places. You're either going to go to heaven or you're going to go to hell. The subject of today's sermon describes hell. As I said, it's very challenging for me to do this, okay? I don't want you to think it's not. But why? You see, a lot of people in this world, they struggle with the idea that a righteous, a holy, and loving God would send people to a place of, let's face it, eternal torment. It causes people to turn away from God. They'll, they'll become disbelievers. They'll, they'll be in disgust. They'll argue that God would never send someone to a place like that. 
over some sin that uh, as a human being we can would consider something small you know outside of the bible you don't see hell but the bible does teach us about these these invisible places these spiritual realms i'll show you hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 it says this now faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen now that word evidence there i'm pretty sure i don't have to explain it to you but i believe in this here it's talking about you know a person realizing their sins they feel guilty if you will so faith can have both a sweet and positive side you know where it gives us assurance we can look ahead have hope we can see that good things are coming that God has promised us these good things but it also convicts us it gives us the ability to see the invisible this inv invisible and spiritual realm right so that we understand the threat you know the warning for us as a sinner and, and it's our faith it's our faith that lets us see the invisible and the the spiritual realm right like I said hell as this place of eternal torment it's one that for people it's very uncomfortable for them to think about it you'll usually have them turn away they'll plug their ears I'm pretty sure that when people listen to this video for a little bit, they're going to plug their ears up. They might turn it off. But while I was researching for it, I found an interview with Pope Francis. Now, this, this interview was back in 2015. And when I was listening to this interview, um, I felt like... Pope Francis was leaning into that doctrine that a lot of people have now of, of annihilation. Let me pull that up. I want to read to you what Pope Francis said in this interview. He said, What happens to that lost soul? Will it be punished and how? The response of Francis is distinct and clear. There is no punishment but the annihilation of that soul. All the others will participate in the beatitude of lot living in the presence of the Father. The souls that are annihilated will not take part in that banquet. With the death of the body, their journey is finished. Now, sure, sure, I'm a human, just like you. Just like all these people who believe that God doesn't send someone to the torments of hell. I, I can understand that it's very difficult to to grasp a hold of that but that does not mean we should avoid facing it facing the reality when we read revelations chapter 14 verses 9 to 11 it helps us to understand what the Bible teaches us about it now You've heard me deliver messages on the end times here many, many times. Um, <laughs> I find it, some people find it odd just how much I can talk about that and sound joyful with it, right? And it makes me think about, like I've told you in the past about my uncle J.W. Prince, whose picture I recently put up on the Sermons in the Park Facebook page um, with, his, uh, with his obituary. But... He was always a very joyful and happy man, no matter what. He was always so happy. What I found as I've gotten more and more into the ministry is that when you meditate, right, on the, on the Word of God, and by that I mean biblically meditate, you find a subject, a subject like, like this one, hell. When you meditate on it, you can become you'll you'll find that you become happier than you've ever been. Now I know that sounds odd, but it's the truth. When you meditate on what you deserve, honestly as a sinner, what you deserve. 
you realize just what Jesus is delivering you from. Right? Now, there are several things that can happen. You, you'll, you'll become more thankful to God and to Jesus. You'll, you'll gain a new perspective on the suffering that you, you, might, you might be going through right now. You know, you might be hurting. You might be sick. But you'll find a new perspective on it. You'll, you'll turn away from all of that complaining that you find yourself doing. The murmuring that you find yourself doing. You'll find yourself full of joy and thankfulness that, that God has done these great things in you. Once you get rid of that eternal torment, there's a problem. Because there's that other word, Savior and salvation. You'll find that if, you, if there's no torment, then a, a Savior is useless. Because when you use those words, Savior and salvation, that implies that someone is saving you from some grave danger, some, not some little minor problem, right? Right? If you get rid of that grave danger, you don't need a savior. But the Bible clearly reminds us that we need a savior. How we need salvation. We should praise God for that. Because see, through faith in Jesus, we have salvation. Right now, you and I are still in the days of revelation. We're still being offered salvation. When we look at the subject of today's sermon, Romans chapter, I'm sorry, Revelation chapter 14 verses 9 to 11, we find ourselves in the middle of the book of Revelation. In that book, we see the veil is being pulled back on that spiritual and that invisible spiritual realm. We see Jesus, we see his glory, we see the future, and we read, quote-unquote, what must soon take place. Now, I've already done a full expository on the book of Revelation. You can find that right here on YouTube or, or um, yeah. And by the time that we reach this spot in Revelation, we you'll have a full grasp on understanding the spiritual force of evil that old snake or the dragon Satan he has a, a an incredible hatred for human beings especially the people of God he attacks us right he accuses us daily nightly but as we see in the book of Revelation in the future his attacks on us will become worse we see the devil will bring, he'll bring out his masterpiece. Amen. That, that Antichrist. Now, we see the Antichrist sometimes called the beast from the sea in Revelation, especially in Revelation chapter 13. Now, I want to mention this time because I don't think I ever have, but nowhere in Revelation do we see John use that word Antichrist. Now, he does over in First and Second John. Now, that word, Antichrist, that literally means a substitute Christ, one that what takes the place of Christ. We see him called the man of sin in, in Second Thessalonians chapter 2. We see him called Little Horn in Daniel. Now, honestly, we know very little about him, right? But... I have done several episodes on the Antichrist that you can find on the YouTube channel. But we know that the Antichrist is a world leader. He seems to somehow miraculously resurrect from a fatal wound to his head. Uh, that's in Revelation chapter 13. Personally, I think that this resurrection that we're, I spoke about right now the, 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 from the wound in his head I think that's how he gets full confidence from the world. Now, before that, we know that the world will suffer seven trumpet judgments. Um, those are in Revelations 8 to 9. 
Now, the world is ravaged. All the green, ga all the green grass is gone. A third of the world trees have been burnt away. A third of the oceans have turned to blood. A third of the sea creatures have died. And, and one thing, a third of the world, the, the fresh water has turned into a poison. So as you can imagine, with all of that going on, that political climate, they're, they, they, they're, they're going to hope for a leader to come out. And they get one. One that will take over the world. Let's read real quick. Revelation chapter 13 we're going to read verses 7 and 8, which says this. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain for the foundation of the world. So, look at that. Not only has he taken control of the government, taking control of the military, but people are starting to worship him. If we read chapter 13, we also read about you know, his, his good buddy there, the false prophet. How he's the one that called the beast from the earth. He's the one that will lead this new one world faith that will worship the Antichrist. We read how he builds this thing called an with the well in the revelation it's called an image some it's some sort of an idol that it's either going to represent the antichrist or it gives him some kind of honor whatever and the the uh, false prophet will be able to use the military this of this one world government which is now a police state to basically force people to worship the beast Let's look at the end of chapter 13. You'll see what I'm talking about. Verses, uh, so Revelation chapter 13, verses 15 to 18. And now remember, here it's talking about the false prophet. Uh, you'll see that he's called the second beast. We read this. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed, and he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark on their right hand or their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that has the mark. And the name of the beast, or the number of the beast, here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number six hundred threescore and six. Now a true Christian, the ones that have their their uh, their their name written in the in the Lamb's Book of Life, as we read earlier, they're not going to participate in this false religion. Okay, they'll not. They're not going to want to. They're not going to bow down to this idol. They're not going to worship it or him, and they're not going to take his mark. So they're going to face persecution, right? And and this is why we read Daniel say that. He will kill them. He will make war against them. And sadly, uh, for a short time, he's going to win. So, you're going to say, why did you go into that? Well, because, as I've said time and time again, context is important. And this is the context that we find Revelation 14 in. And right slap in the middle of chapter 14... We see something. We see three angels who are, are sent out, you know, one after the other. So one is sent, then another, then another. They're sent to warn people of this coming judgment. Revelation chapter 14, we're going to read verses 6 and 7. It says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation, and kindred, and tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, and give glory to Him. For the hour of His judgment is come, and worship Him 
that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. So right after that, we see the second angel, right? Uh, this is in verse 8. So let's pull that back up. Revelation chapter 14, verse 8. It says this, and there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornications. Now, Babylon, that's the culture of the world at that time, of the government. It's, um, they're all united in their rebellion against God. And notice how it tells us that they're following their lusts, their lusts of the, of the eyes, of the flesh they're, they're, these people are boastful they're prideful and then we come to that angel the third one this is the, now this is the focus of today's sermon so we're going to actually read now Revelation chapter 14 verses 9 to 11 let me uh, I want to scroll down a little bit here we read this and the third angel looked at the I'm sorry. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture, notice that, without mixture, into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, and in the presence of the Lamb, Sorry, and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up for one. I'm sorry, forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast and his image, whosoever receiveth the mark or his name. So we're reading that these people who are living in the, in this time period, the final days, they're all being pressured. They're being basically forced to worship the beast, the Antichrist in his image they they're being pressured to accept this mark as if they don't accept the mark they can't buy they can't sell now think about that we know that the antichrist is going to be he's going to be attractive and as far as people are going to see he rescued them from 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 everything from economic disaster from sal from starvation and not, that's not to mention all those previous judgments that God has sent. So this is going to give them every reason to accept it willingly. Because you see, they're going to have affection for this man. This isn't even to mention how he's a skillful speaker, a politician. And when you add, when you add to that, that he, he's going to perform signs and miracles, right? So, of course, his resurrection from the dead will be one of those, one of those wonders that he performs. There's a negative side, right? Because, you see, if you do not accept the mark, you can't buy or sell. And then, eventually, you're going to be put to death. So, what you have is a police state that has supernatural demonic power they're gonna hunt down dissidents and this is gonna compel people to bow down to worship the beast and, and his image so worldwide you'll have a police state you'll have a government that's working under the Antichrist and it causes fear in the people worldwide but we need to remember something what did Jesus say because there's something that is much worse than the fear of that Antichrist. Luke chapter 12, verses 4 to 5. Jesus said, And I say unto you, my friends, notice Jesus always calls us his friends, Be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. But I will forewarn you, whom ye shall fear, fear him, which after he hath killed with, with, I'm sorry, 
after he hath killed, hath power to cast into hell. See that word cast? This is cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. There are these pastors. There are these evangelists. There are these missionaries. Whatever they want to call themselves. Who will tell you, I don't want to scare people into heaven. Now, I'm not speaking ill of these guys. Because, I mean, at, at worst case... Or I should say best case, not worst case. At best case, they're misguided. Personally, me, I would be delighted to scare you into heaven, amen, into an eternity in the presence of our Lord and Savior. Do you think that Jesus was worried about scaring people? No. We see him tell people that they should fear God because he can destroy us forever in hell. We should fear him over a government that can only kill your body because what are they going to do after that? Do you see, God's forcing a choice. He's warning you, warning everyone. Even if, they, even if they're a believer, he's saying, don't do it. Fear God, be willing to die for Christ. The pressure to take that mark is going to be strong. If you'll willingly take that mark, you're making a spiritual choice. No one's going to just stumble into it. I, I have had, I've had to say this time and again to people who, who've, back when the, the COVID vaccine was going on, I was getting calls and talk, people were asking me, you know, is this the mark of the beast? And no, you're not going to just stumble into it. It's not going to be some secret plot, you know, to make you take it. No. There's going to be no there're not going to be no ninjas who are going to stick you and go, "Ha, got gotcha. you." Okay? This will be a conscious act. You're going to know what you're doing. Because you're going to be agreeing to the terms of worshiping an idol. Drinking from the cup of wrath is a metaphor, okay? It means that they're completely absorbed in it. They're drinking it. They're being immersed in it. Notice that it's described as drinking the wine of God's fury. Anyone who's ever drank is going to tell you that wine can influence your mind. It can influence your heart. And wrath. Wrath is very a very strong and immediate reaction that we see coming from the Lord. It's vehement. It's hot. It's passionate. And then we have fury. That is a long term, it's smoldering. It's in the memory, right? And we see them used together here. Now this just magnifies their impact. This, is, this has been on God's mind for a long time. And at some point, he just has to unleash that rage that's burning in him like a wildfire. Look at how strong it is. It says, The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture, so yeah, without mixture, into the cup of his indignation. There is no holding back. The reason it's saying it's, 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 it's undiluted, because you see, back in ancient times, People would take their wine and they would mix it. They would mix it in like with like fruit juice or water or something. They would dilute it. But right here, God's fury is full strength. When you think about it, it's chilling. God is omnipotent. God, God is omniscient. And you combine that with a laser-like focus on the destruction of one man. Like a laser beam being focused on one person. That is terrifying. And then we see, a, we see a, a simple prediction here. It says, He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. That right there has got to be more... It's got to be... It's going to be talking about 
the lake of fire that we read about in Revelation chapter 20. This torment with fire and brimstone here, this is like what we see in Sodom and Gomorrah. And we also see it's constantly, constantly in front of the Lamb and the Holy Angels. And that Lamb is, of course, Jesus. That means that Jesus and the angels are watching this. They're not squeamish. They're not embarrassed. There's no shame in it. There's no pity. It's not done in some secret corner. No, 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 no. God is not ashamed of displaying his righteousness. His justice. And his holiness. When he punishes the wicked. Any more than, than, than he... Ooh. <laughs> right? He's not ashamed of it. Any more ashamed than he was when he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah with fire and brimstone. Or even that flood. Noah's flood. There's also another audience here as well. I want you to look at something. Isaiah chapter 66, verse 24. And they shall go forth and look upon the carcass of the men that have transgressed against me. For their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be abhorred unto all flesh. To me, now this this might just be me, but to me this sounds like if you're redeemed, you'll be able to see this. Doesn't that make sense? Why would God hide this from his children? At this point, we could handle it because we know that God's not ashamed of it. He wants us to know about it. I'll show you. Look at Revelation chapter 21, verse 4. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Meaning, they'll see it, and they're not going to cry about it. There will be no emotional pain. There will be no anguish. What, while we're up there in heaven, we will not be any less happy because we know some of the people who, who we love are being punished. If anything, it'll make us more thankful, more humble. By then, we're going to realize, hey, we deserve this. The only difference between us and them is the grace of God. We see in verse 11 where it speaks on how hell is eternal. It says, And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. They have no rest, day or night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Eternal torment that they will be conscious of. There's no escape from it. This is why people find it difficult to accept it. Just like in that beautiful hymn that we all sing in church, Amazing Grace, it says this, When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. And with hell, we have a mirror image of heaven. We have 10,000 years there with no less days. No escape in the future. In the future. But there is an escape right now. Today. Just like we see in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 15, Paul says this, While it is said, Today, if ye, have, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation. It's time to escape right now. Now, I think that we can all benefit from having a wider understanding of what the New Testament tells us about hell and also what we should do with that. Wayne Grudem tells us that hell is a place of eternal conscious punishment for the wicked. Me, I always liked reading Jonathan Edwards, you know, his sermons. One of my favorites is his 1741 sermon that's titled Sinners in the Hand of an Angry God. Ray Comfort talks about this one a lot. 
You know, Jonathan Edwards says this, O oh, sinner, I consider the fearful danger you are in. It is a great furnace of wrath, a wide and bottomless pit, full of fire and wrath, that you are held over in the hand of that God whose wrath is provoked and incensed as much against you as against many of the damned in hell. You hang by a slender thread with the flames of divine wrath flashing about it, and ready ever moment to singe it and burn it apart. And you have no interest in any mediator, and nothing to lay hold of to save yourself, nothing to keep off the flames of wrath, nothing of your own, nothing that you ever done, nothing that can keep that can do to induce God to spare you in one moment more. Edwards was like me because he also struggled to find the a way to describe the reality of hell. And that caused a lot of English literature classes in high school to study this sermon. And they did it so that they could debunk or mock it. But think about it. Why did he struggle with it? Another preacher whose sermons I like to study is John Piper. I make no good. <laughs> yeah, I listen to him in my living room a lot. Now, he said this. What high school student is ever asked to come to grips with what, re what really is at issue here? If the Bible is true, and it says that someday Christ will tread his enemies like a wine press with anger that is fierce and almighty, and if you, if you are a pastor charged with applying biblical truth to your people so that they will flee the wrath to come, then what would your language be? What would you say to make people feel the reality of the text like these? Edwards labored over language. He labored over image and metaphor because he was, he was stunned and awed at the reality that he saw in the Bible. Edwards believed that it was impossible to exaggerate the horror and reality of hell. High school teachers would do well to ask their students the really probing question. Why is it that Jonathan Edwards struggled to find images for wrath and hell that shock and frighten while contemporary preachers try to find abstractions and circumlocations that move away from concrete, touchable, Bible pictures of unquenchable fire and underlying worms, or I'm sorry, undying worms and gnashing teeth. If our students were po posed with this simple historical question, my guess is that some of the brighter ones would answer because Jonathan Edwards really believed in hell, but most preachers today do not. It's only natural as a human to be repulsed by this. When you compare Jesus to the God of the Old Testament, Mark Twain said this, It's a misunderstanding to think that think of Jehovah as a fire-breathing, wrath-filled God, but Jesus as a gentle, meek, and mild. Jesus was a thousand billion times crueler than ever Jehovah was in the Old Testament. Meek and gentle? By and by, we'll examine that popular sarcasm by the light of hell which he invented. And then you have Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin said this, I can hardly see how anyone ought to wish Christianity to be true, for if so, the plain language of the text seems to show that the men who do not believe, and this would include my father, brother, and almost all my best friends, will be everlastingly punished, and this is a damnable doctrine. But, me, I would look at old Charles in the eye and tell him that wishing it was true, <laughs> right, and not, or not, th that wouldn't change the reality of it. Then you have the theologian, this man, he, he's a Canadian man, his name was Clark Pinnock, who sadly strayed far from the, his evangelical roots, right? He said this, I was led to question the traditional belief in everlasting conscious torment because of more revulsion and broader theological considerations, not first of all 
on scriptural grounds. Did you hear that? Anyway, let's go on. It just does not make any sense to say that a God of love will torture people forever for sins done in the context of a finite life. It's time for evangelicals to come out and say that the biblical and morally appropriate doctrine of hell is annihilation, not everlasting torment. And what saddens me, what saddens me, is that John Scott, he, he's one of the most well-respected expositors. He was drawn into this teaching because he said, emotionally, I feel the concept of eternal conscious torment intolerable and do not understand how people can live with it without either cauterizing their feelings or cracking under the strain. And then, then back in 2011, Robe Bell, he, he released a book titled Love Wins, a book about heaven, hell, and the fate of, the, of every person who ever lived. I read a summary for it that was written by Kevin D. Young, and he said this. Here's the gist. Hell is what we create for ourselves when we reject God's love. Hell is both a present reality for those who resist God and a future reality for those who die unready for God's love. Not quite ready when you die, hell is what we make of heaven when we cannot accept the good news of God's forgiveness and mercy. But hell is not forever. God will have his way. How can his good purposes fail? Every sinner will turn to God and realize that he has already been reconciled to God in this life or in the next life. In the end, love wins. But guess what? The Bible does not teach any of this. Jesus taught more on hell than anyone who ever lived. Because he came here to warn us about it and then to save us from it. Look at his Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5 verses 21 to 22. It says, Ye have heard it I'm sorry, you have heard ye have heard that it was said of them of old times, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of the judgment, and whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, which means fool, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. So then you look over at Mark chapter 9, verses 43 to 48, it says, And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter, enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into the hell into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire, where the, herm di where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Now, back in Matthew chapter, back in Matthew, all right, we find ch chapter eight, verses eleven to twelve, which says, "And I say unto you, that many shall come from the east and the west, shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven." But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew chapter 13, verses 41 to 42 says this. Now, first off, I want you to remember something. Jesus here is telling a parable. This is the parable of the weeds and the wheat. All right? And he says this. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels... And they shall gather out. I'm sorry. They shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, 
and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire that shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then in Luke chapter 16, verses 23 to 24, this time, right, we're looking at that story of Lazarus and the rich, Lazarus and the rich man, which uh, if you want, I, I did a whole sermon on that uh, a while back. Um, there we read this. Jesus says this. And in, in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torment, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. So, just from these verses alone, and others that we could look into, but we're not going that far. How long does it last? Forever, right? We see its environment. We see the effects. So you might ask, well, what's the purpose of it? Well, hell is punishment. Punishment for those who are unrepentant, right? Who, who did not accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior, right? You have your, you have your sins of commission, by that I mean things like that you you should you should not have done. That's your sins of um, you know commission. Then you have your sins of omission. That's when you did not do something that you should have done. Look at Revelation chapter twenty one, verse eight. Let me uh, scroll down again. Sorry. It says, "By the fearful." and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their place in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone which is the second death what about the fear of what about the sin of omission right let's look at Matthew chapter 25 verses 41 to 42 because you see a lot of people they what is they, they look at me and go, that's not one. But anyway, read, read right here. Matthew 25, verses 41 to 42. Then shall he say also unto them on the left, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was an hungered, and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. So, you might be asking, what percentage of people will end up in hell? Well, Jesus tells us. Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 to 14. Enter ye into the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth into life. And few there be that find it. So we see what? We see many. We see few. That tells us that, sadly, more people are on that road of destruction. So what about the environment of hell? Well, we see it repeatedly referred to as a lake of fire. There are so many people who try to say, Oh, preacher, that's just a metaphor. So I ask you this, a metaphor for what? Metaphor is just a word. And, so, and even and even then, when you see it used as an expression, it's usually less than the thing that you're trying to compare it to. So honestly, does that ease the reality of what hell is? What about the effects? First off, we need to realize that every good and perfect gift that we have, that you've ever experienced... That includes common grace blessings. All of them come from where? From God. They show us something. They show us that God is here. God is present. So first, we see all of those things are going to be removed. Why? Because God isn't there. There's God's presence is gone. So why is it so important for me to point that out? Because we find that any of the unsaved people, are going to tell you this. 
and I've heard it so many times. They want to go to hell because that's where their friends are. But you need to remember something. Friendship is a blessing. And that, that blessing includes things like joy, celebrating, happiness. All of that is gone. And you'll find, all you're going to find there are bitterness and anger, suffering, hatred, all of those pleasures of life, lawful and unlawful, all of it. All of it that you traded for your soul, gone. The Bible makes it clear, everyone in hell is cast out and separated from everything that's good. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verses 8 and 9 In flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and they obeyed not the gospel or our of our Lord Jesus Christ who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power So what happened they're shut out Just like those 5 unprepared versions that we see over in Matthew chapter 25 verses 11 to Jesus says after came also the other virgins saying Lord Lord open to us but he answered and said verily I say unto you I know you not it's our responsibility as Christians to tell people the truth about hell especially when they speak of it so light-hearted and say that they would rather go to hell we need to realize that yes this conscious torment yes it's taught in the Bible look at the parable of the rich man and Lazarus like I said I've done at least two sermons on this one in that parable we see the rich man is unaware of what he of, I mean I should say he is aware He's aware of where he is. He also knows his own story. Look what, Lazarus, look what Abraham says to him. Luke chapter 16, verse 25. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And then we read that he knows that his brothers, he knows that he wants to warn them. He also regrets how he had acted. This shows us that the people in hell, they're conscious of their torment. We see that hell is everlasting. The fire never goes out. Look at Revelation chapter 14 verse 11. It says, And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. The fourth thing we need to realize, it's a place of regret. Look what we see in Matthew chapter 13, verse 50. And shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. The f and the fifth thing is that the place is <coughs> utter darkness. Matt, look at Peter chapter. So I'm sorry, Second Peter. Oh boy, sorry, I've been backed up too far. Second Peter, chapter two, verse seventeen. These are well, I mean, yeah. These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. That's Second Peter, chapter two, verse seventeen. And then we're going to look at Matthew chapter twenty-two, verse thirteen. It says, "Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot." Take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. As a Christian, you need to stand against that sentiment belief that God does not send anyone to hell. This is one that I hear from a lot of people. 
fellow believers, they believe in hell, but they think that they need to protect God from people who do not like that topic. Like they need to defend God. A lot of people, including myself, will tell people that God does not send you to hell. You went there on your own free will. Because of all your life, you've chosen to separate yourself from God. That God giving you what you want. But, something I've learned through studying this, that doesn't line up. You can't send yourself to hell on Judgment Day because the reality is those who get sent there, it says it, are bound hand and foot and tossed in there by the angels. But still, there are many who teach that, that belief that you send yourself there. But no one goes there because they prefer to go there. Right? Everyone would rather be with God and His saints. And as far as fear being a motivator to come to Christ, to, to repent, why should we despise the fear of hell as a motive? We should be afraid of the wrath. We should run away from hell. We should run into the outstretched arms of Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And to, and to quote that famous hymn, Amazing Grace again, because we sing it all the time. Twas now and aid if. <laughs> Twas grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved. If you're listening to this right now, if you've made it this far, you should be motivated to run to Christ. Do it now! No, knowing what hell will really be like, do, do you know? How much longer you're going to live? None of us do. We could die in our sleep. And when we die, guess what? It's too late. Another famous preacher, D.L. Moody, he used to tell this story when he preached. Because he was preaching on hell. He said that this man came out of a saloon. He got on a horse. He turned, he saw a deacon from the local church. And he asked the deacon, jokingly of course, how far is it to hell? And of course that deacon, he, he couldn't answer that. The man rode away and the deacon continued on his way when suddenly he heard a noise. He turned around and he saw this horse had reared up and thrown that man to the ground. That man now had a broken neck and was dead. For, that man, for, that, for the answer for that man, it was not that far. The reason D.L. Moody, as well as myself, shared that story is because he wanted to show, like I do, we never know how long we have. We should run to Jesus. We should run towards that only refuge. Jesus died on that cross in our place so that we could have eternal life. Hell is eternal. But it's not life. You can escape hell. All of you have to, all you got to do is turn away from your own self-righteousness. Have faith in Jesus. Repent of your sins. Turn away from those sins. Turn to Jesus. Accept Him as your Lord and Savior. Honestly, I don't know how much more plain I can make it. Don't put this off until tomorrow. You're not guaranteed tomorrow. And don't think that you need, oh, I need more information. No, you don't. Don't worry about what your unbelieving friends are going to think of you. You do not need to fear anything but God. Today is the day of salvation. If you run to Christ, that fear of hell should be an infinite source of thankfulness for you. You will be so thankful that God saved you, that God the Father, in the story of the prodigal, He's the Father in the prodigal son. Another one I love to tell, He's the Father in the prodigal son. He's got his arms stretched out wide. He's welcoming you back. He's forgiving your debt. Paul tells us that since we are in Christ, there is therefore no condemnation. You're not going to want those sinful things back. Because you'll, you're forever thankful to God. 
What I'm about to say to you, I say out of love. If you find yourself complaining about your aches and your pains, stop. Seek medical help, but stop complaining. Take your medicine. Don't let those things dominate your mind. Why do I say that? You've been delivered from hell. You find yourself complaining about these temporary setbacks in life. Difficulties like, oh, financial problems. Stop. God's delivered you from hell. Oh, I feel lonely. I feel rejected. I feel isolated. The church should alleviate those things. Stop. God has delivered you from hell. You've been delivered from an eternity of bodily pain, from financial burden, from isolation. It's hard for a lot of people to understand this, but in heaven, there's not going to be any introverts. There's not going to be any recluses. All of us are going to be social. So, as I said, you're delivered from isolation. When you consider that, how can you be unhappy? You see, I've come to grips with that. Out of, because I used to wonder that about my Uncle J.W., why he's always so happy. Because he knew. He knew he was delivered. Early in my ministry, I used to have this habit of using <laughs> Charles Dickens' story, uh, The Christmas Carol, when I would evangelize. So, allow me to do that once more. Everyone who has read that book, or, or even watched the movies, has a vivid memory of the ghost of Christmas yet to come. We see him show Scrooge that he will die. So what does Scrooge do? He's shocked. He starts to deny it. When you watch the musical version that starred Albert Finney, thank you Guy Pelton for pointing this one out to me, we see Scrooge go further than Dickens ever did. In that one, we see the ghost show Scrooge an image of himself in hell. And after the, the ghost departs, Scrooge, he wakes up. The night's over. It's Christmas Day. Scrooge is hugging the bedpost when suddenly he realizes he's not in hell anymore. He's alive. What happens? He starts to give everything away. He starts to do good things. That's how any of us would respond. He has a sudden joy. He's he, happy. He's energetic. We would act the same way once we realize just what God has done with us in Jesus. As Paul says, we're free from condemnation. All your needs are met. You'll be grateful. You'll live to serve others. We should worship Jesus for his courage. When we do, we can, as the hymn says, go with me to dark Gethsemane. And we can see him reco recoil from that cup while he's praying on the night when Judas betrayed him. That cup contained exactly what we've been studying here. It, cont it contained hell with all of its characteristics, with all of its implications. When we read it, we see that God the Father was offering him the cup of hell for him to drink it in Gethsemane. And what do we hear Jesus pray for? He prays for it three times. Look with me. Matthew chapter 16, verses 39 and 42. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nonetheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. In verse 42, he went away again the second time and prayed, saying, O oh my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. This right here is the most courageous and loving act any human has ever had. The more you meditate on hell, the more you meditate on the torment of hell, the more you can understand the courage of Jesus. He drank that cup for us. Have you ever looked on another person with lust? Read with me. Matthew chapter 7, I mean, Matthew chapter 5, 
verses 7 to 29. You have heard it was said by them of old times, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, Whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members shall perish, and not that the whole body should cast into hell. So, can fear be a motivator to be holy and not to sin? Jesus says it is. So, many people think that we should analyze even a verse like the one we just read, why flee sin that's all you gotta do if you find some part of your life causing you to sin I don't care what part it is music internet stop Jesus says that it's better to eliminate that part of your life than to go to hell if you think you're okay with going to hell as long as you can enjoy your life you are deceived Look what Paul says over in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 3 to 4, and then we're also going to look at verse 6. But fornication and all uncleanliness and covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather give of, giving of thanks. Verse 6 adds this, Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. So yes, fear of hell, good motivator to take steps to be holy. You've heard me on here encouraging you, evangelize to the lost. Look around you. Every day you're passing people. People that Jesus told you are on the broad highway headed to destruction, to hell. Say a prayer. Ask the Lord to give you a revelation on what that punishment is. Because what is the wailing and gnashing of teeth? What does that look like? What can you do to be grieved enough to reach these people? Do you know what Paul tells us about the unbelievers? Look with me at Romans chapter 9, verses 1 to 4. I say the truth in Christ. I lie not. My conscience also bearing my witness in the Holy Ghost that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption, and the glory, and the co covenants, and the giving of the law, and the service of God, and the promises. Paul, was, Paul is saying that he is willing to die and go to hell to save these other people. If you're not at that point, be honest. In your prayer, say something like, I don't have much of a sorrow for the loss. Not like I should. God, would you work in my heart so I grieve over the spiritual destination of those who are outside of Christ. You know that God will move in you. That he will give you zeal. He will help you be active in evangelism. You know it. Evangelism is not convenient. It never has been. It never will be. It has a cost. As you go about your day, look for opportunities, whether it's at work or at school, while you're shopping, share the gospel. Warn others of the judgment that they will face sometime. If you want some ideas on how to evangelize, I recommend like going on YouTube and looking up Living Waters. Um, I follow Ray Comfort. You know, I learned a lot from Ray Comfort from his videos. They they will teach you how to do it. He has a whole series on there, the School for Biblical Evangelism. You can watch it and learn. So today I'm gonna ask that you allow me and join me in a closing prayer. 
Father, this is a difficult, deep, and sobering topic, right? And I pray, Father, that we, we would be able to to feel the weight of the truth of these things in Revelations chapter 14, verses 9 to 11. That we will not shrink back from him. That we would understand that, that Jesus drank the cup for us that we might have eternal life. That we would give him thanks. And Father, that we will give you thanks for sending your beloved Son and pouring out your wrath on him, our substitute our lightning rod, that we might be delivered and protected. I pray one more time for anyone that was listening who, who clicked on this video or this podcast episode. I pray that they have, if they have not made the decision yet, that, you would be, that they would believe in Christ while there's time and learn to trust in Him. Oh Lord, I pray that you give us a greater zeal, that we a greater zeal than we have ever displayed before for evangelism to to the ends of the earth. I pray this in the name of your son Jesus Christ. Amen. So I want to thank you all for joining me here. I know this one was a lot longer than what I've what I've done lately, and it just it, this is this one was really important. So thank you all for joining me here. I pray the Lord continues to bless and keep you, and I'll see you all soon. I love you. God bless you. You have been listening to Sermons in the Park with Reverend Jamie McCaskill. Be sure to follow us on YouTube, BitChute, and Rumble. And as always, thank you for listening. There's joy for the morning, sinner be still. Earth has no sorrow, heaven can't heal. Earth has no sorrow, heaven can't heal. So let